Hi, I'm here with Dale Gibson, candidate for CD7 Council District. And we'd like to introduce him to you and have him talk about a few of his uh, primary things he wants to take and do for the 7 Council District. So, Gail? Thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. And, and, cool. and uh, I'm always eager to get out and speak to the folks that live in the area. That's, that's my biggest reason for getting into this race. I was in Neighborhood Council, Foothill Trails District Neighborhood Council. Uh, I'm currently president of the Equine Advisory Committee, so I already represent all the equestrians in the city of Los Angeles. And everybody needs a voice. My, my biggest pain is that I'm meeting people every day and they're like, well, how do I reach these certain services or how do I get here or how do I get there? And right now, because we have no city council representation, there's no one to reach out to. The neighborhood councils are very frustrated because to me, because I'm with the neighborhood council mm -hmm. and the neighborhood council needs to be the first line for people to come to. And as a council person, my promise to everyone is that I will meet with the, every city council in the district at least once a month. I want people to be able to get a hold of their city council person. And if that's if I'm lucky enough, that's me. Then I want to be oh. talking to them. Okay. So one, two, the other of uh, the main issues is the homeless issue. Yes, sir. Uh, what would you do about the homeless issue if you had the opportunity? Well, for those of you who know me, I live in Sunland on Wentworth Street, and the county mitigation bank is on the backside of my ranch. Um, if you follow me on Facebook, last week I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, thought my son left the TV on, went to the front porch, opened the door, and there was a homeless person on my front porch. Huh? There was a homeless person on my front porch that was trying to start a campfire. Well, so the, experience. so the, the, the homeless issue really did come home to me. Yeah, I see. Um, in my experience, I've been, obviously, for a candidate to, to deal with a problem, you need to understand it. So um, living next to the mitigation bank, we've torn down drug houses back there. So what I'm trying to say is the homeless issue is a two-part problem. First half is you've got these vandals and people that are trying to sell drugs out of there. And I've seen them. We went back and tore, tore two big houses down where they had guns and were ethanol and whatever they do to make these drugs. We went back there, my community and a bunch of equestrians, and, and um, took four roll-off dumpsters. This was several years ago. But the other side of the problem is it's, it, it really touches me is there are people out there that need help. Me and my team, I went uh, to South... What was it? South Garden Center in Tahunga, and it's a halfway house for homeless. And the stories, I just, I just sat down and just listened to some of the stories. I met a lady named Ann who'd been on the street for 10 years. And I, I don't know if she became psychotic because of the cocaine, but her life consisted of cocaine, turning tricks, so she could get cocaine, and turning tricks. But she was very happy to tell us that she'd get caught up got help. She's in a halfway house now. A beautiful lady. She looked like she'd be working in somebody's office or something. And, and, and just having conversations and she was just very happy to be talking to people about what she went through just to raise awareness. Yeah. When we left there, I was, it, it got me. And um, the gentleman that runs the house, Jimmy, he said, you know, you're the first person to visit us in 11 years. So people need to be aware of that side of the problem too. There are people out there that not only need help, but want, want help. help. And there are a lot of services out there if we connect them up the right way that they can get help. The services actually exist now. Services do exist. She's sure. living on her state disability insurance mm -hmm. at, a, at a facility having, well, we've been back there twice since then, you know, closed drives and stuff there. Just, yeah. it affected me so much. So, you know, it's one thing to hear about it, but to actually see it on your front porch or to go to a place like that, into hunger, right up the street. And then when we found out that nobody had been there to visit them in 11 years. So it is a, it's a very tough problem. Like I said, on one side, these drug dealers and little vandals out there partying in the wash. I met a lady named Fran while I was out walk, walking the and knocking on doors. And the neighbor said, if you talk to Fran, you might want to talk to her. She lives right next to Or Vista Park in Sunland. These characters 
climb over her yard, she's got a block wall, climb over into her yard, tear everything up, kick everything over, party all night in her yard. She, she's scared. She's hiding in her house. And I didn't ask her why she didn't call 911. I'm, I, maybe, maybe she tried before. Maybe she was scared. Next morning she goes out and looks. And they're leaving. They're like, see you later, Grandma. I'm sorry. The cowboy in me says that's not, that's not right. I gave her my personal number and called LAPD Foothill Division and got her hooked up. And now they're keeping an eye on her and taking care of her. The, the problem is she didn't know who to call or what to do. Are you suggesting that they need uh, some agency or some group of people, let's say, working for the city, that can coordinate all these various people, the various agencies out here? Uh, well, I think to, as a neighborhood to solve council some of these problems? and local, just to connect up. As a, as a council person, I, all I want to do is help people connect. We have a lot of good services now because she didn't know who to call. So okay. not just as a city council person, a neighborhood council, and then get the city services that we have. Would you push a, uh, an effort to take and to coordinate this in these various neighborhoods? Absolutely. Sunland to Hunga. We need, a, we need a, it, it's so bad, and not just Sunland to Hunga, Silmar here in Pacoima, everywhere. I mean, they're in Latuna Canyon. It's, yeah, of course they are. It's the whole them. district. It's the whole district. And the city of Los Angeles now is under siege. So I would go as far as to say, some kind of state of emergency, and let's deal with this problem first because it's a big problem. So that would be one of your concerns? My biggest concern right yeah. away. Let's move off to another one. Um, what about the vendors? Street vending. Street vending. You know, we had street vending up and down the, Sunland, or the Foothill Corridor in, in Sunland, Tahunga, and then it became illegal. Right now it's decriminalized, but they haven't figured out a way to regulate it yet, so it's not enacted. But talking to a lot of um, the store owners and restaurant owners, at first they seemed like they were a little frustrated because it was competition. And then after the street vendors were gone, I had several of them tell me that actually it wasn't such a bad idea because what they realized it was doing was bringing, bringing in business to their businesses also. So it was like drawing attention to the businesses that were there. So yeah. again, I, anything I think or say we need to sit down and decide this together. As a as a person that's been in the neighborhood for 31 years, mm -hmm. I love this area. I came out here from Kentucky, which is a beautiful place, and this is a beautiful place. We're at the San Gabriel foothills. We need to uh, exploit, if you will, the tourism up there. We can go, for, as an equestrian, we can go up there and ride in the mountains. It's, it's gorgeous. Give more people access to that. And uh, as far as street vendors, figure out the proper regulations for it, but the folks I've talked to are actually in favor of it. Oh, Regulated. Regulated. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, have you considered uh, just how a city would regulate it? Let's say because they, they need health. They do. Uh, inspections, they need uh, license inspections. They do. Well, I own a, I'm a small business owner. I own a ranch over in Sunland. Mm -hmm. Health department comes out, animal services come out, and I'm already regulated. So I think most of the infrastructure there is in place through the county and through the city. We just need to figure out what how the to expand it to do the and what the proper regulations yeah. will be for those vehicles. Again, let's talk to the other business owners. If the people are against it, mm -hmm. then that's what we'll push for. But a government, to me, that doesn't care what the people think and does what it wants, that's a bigger problem as anything. So if, yeah. if everybody decides let's do it, then let's do it. Well, let me see what other questions I got here. They're talking about uh, putting $10 million on the side to accommodate uh, legal advice for, for the people who are here illegally and those who will be, they expect that the Trump administration will be attempting to deport and so they're concerned about taking ten million dollars and putting it together to provide those those legal things. What do you think, legal attorneys and stuff? What do you think about that? Here's the problem. When people hear these things, we get this big knee-jerk reaction. First yeah. off, we need to talk as a city, the mayor, and the group, and talk with the state and talk with the Fed and see what they have in mind. We don't even know what they've got in mind. That's true. From what I was understood, the only people that he wants to deport are criminals and drug dealers. That's that's what I've we heard. I've heard that too. And if I'm not, if I'm mistaken, then we need to know. But right now, everybody's reacting, reacting. 
Um, the state has set aside money, county set aside money, now the city set aside money, but nobody has facts. So before we knee jerk and, and start going crazy, let's find out what the real we'll story is. We've identified what we're concerned about. Exactly. I have, I have, again, 31 years here. I have friends from all over. Mm -hmm. I don't want my friends deported. I don't want people that have children that shouldn't be kicked out. But I understand we have a lot of drugs and a lot of problems maybe coming over. And, and I'm not saying from Mexico, but um, from what I understand, coming all over the world across an open border. So let's fix the problem and but let's talk about it before we knee jerk and just start going crazy. Fine. Um, well, the issue I want to speak to. Oh, okay. Um, we have done profits in our area that's been here for many years and provided service to the youth. And done good work. And, and, and done good, solid work. But what happens, we have uh, in the past, the city council's office actually actually expelled people uh, an established uh, nonprofit and move in a new one. And come to find out the new one is an extension from something in San Diego or something from Arizona. And uh, they get the money, they get the buildings, and they get the space and stuff. And these these nonprofits are hurt severely because nonprofits don't have a, a, a lot of money to take and spend. You know, they just um, they just trying to how can I put it exist right. on the string. And uh, city council in the past have actually actually done this cat type work. As a matter of fact, they did it in Southern Tahunga when they threw the neighborhood council out. Right. And those people have been there, I think it was 11 years, right. and uh, it's wrong. And the city councils basically, I don't mean the city councils, the neighborhood councils basically provide their time, sometimes money, f to the community for free, That's but they're going to take a non-profit and stick it, stick it in the place and take the guys that are serving the community and evict them. That's I'm wrong. Very familiar. What do you think gonna, about that? I'm going to say this over and over and over in my campaign. It's got to be local. It's got to be us. People coming in and making decisions for us that don't live here. That yes. would be like me coming in here, I don't know your home, and telling you how to live. The, and, and, my, and, and I'm going to take it a step further. All my hires, my deputies for the area, will be local. Wow. I've worked with past councilmen uh, as part of the Equine Advisory Committee, and I go meet their deputies. and like somebody's kid from Sacramento or something. Nobody knows our problems like we do. And nobody, when I was out getting on the petition uh, to get on ballot, I got 1,800 signatures. I only needed 1,000. People go, why did you do that? And I said, if you listen to everybody, the local people that were signing my petitions, they have great answers. They know what they want. They know what they, they, they want. Yeah. And I realized right then, if I listen to the people here in our district, I don't think I can do wrong. So it's all got to be local neighborhood first. I tell mm -hmm. everybody, if I win this election, I'm hiring people from the area, and you'll either find me at the local neighborhood city hall there on mm -hmm. Foothill Boulevard, or at my ranch riding my horse, and it's right in the middle of summer. We've been there for 18 years. You'll find me one of those two places. I don't want to go to Sacramento eventually. I want to stay here. I like our neighborhoods. And I think they can be better. So you will not be looking for the next junk. I don't to want Sacramento. to go to Sacramento. I like my horses and my ranch right here where it is. I'm not going anywhere. You guys are stuck with me. Good. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's one of the things a lot of the, my neighbors be talking about is that they want somebody that's going to be here, somebody that live in the community and invest it. In more, more than just living in a house, but, you know. Invested. Uh, with, yeah, we've done, with we've done numerous charities at my ranch. Please, anybody's got a question, look at my paperwork. My phone number is 818-951-4335. If they have a question, call me. My phone number is on all my flyers. I'm not anointed. I'm not backed by the city. I live here. I was asked by local neighborhood council and, 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 um, and equestrian groups to run because... Yeah. Just like Pacoima has Pacoima centric questions yeah. and problems, someone, the, the A2 route for the high speed rail, wants to literally, and I've spoken on this several times, I have a degree in business and a minor in psychology. People are like, really, you're a cowboy? And I, said, <laughs> and I rode bulls to get that degree. Yeah. So I know what hard work is. But if they run that rail through Shadow Hills, Sunland, mm -hmm. every equestrian will leave. 
They said, well, why? And I said, can you imagine riding a horse down a runway at LAX as a plane is landing over your head? I told the lady at NPR radio, she said, that sounds dangerous. And I said, I wouldn't do it, and I'm a stuntman. It, it will run the whole equestrian industry out of the area. California has the largest equestrian industry in the United States. You're running a lot of people and a lot of money out of the area, and we don't want to leave. We love it over there. Oh, yeah. I worked in one more issue, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> well, Dale, yeah. it's been fine talking to you. Oh, thank it's you, been sir. Great. I appreciate it. it fun. And we hope we get this uh, on the air and yeah, get we, a lot of input. We will, and whoever you vote for, vote for somebody local. Please don't. Let's not have somebody that's behind the big machine. Yeah. That's all I got to say about that. Okay. Thanks, thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it.